Again, thank you guys for being with us. If we haven't met yet, my name is Todd, and I just want to begin by giving a glimpse into my mindset for my role here and really any leadership opportunity that I have. So I'm thinking about as I live, as I um, lead, as I communicate, one of my biggest goals is just to have Titus 2, 7, and 8 describe me. And that simply says this, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech so that cannot be condemned. So an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. So that's one of my goals. And today I get the privilege of hosting a conversation with a guest who does this. Like I was trying to think about how to introduce him. And the best way I could introduce him was to say, hey, Titus 2, 7 and 8, he lives this. So Phil Taylor is here with us today. He is the lead mission strategist for CrossNet. That's a local network of churches that we are privileged to be a part of. And Phil, you've been a mentor to me. You've invested in my wife, Whitney, and just in our family. And I am so grateful for that. And you may not realize this, but Phil has invested in each of us. Because behind the scenes, he's been pouring into public church since before we even became a church six years ago. So could we give a warm public church welcome to Phil Taylor? <laughs> Love you. Phil, it really is an honor for you to be with us, and we are actually an elder-led church, which means we have a team of elders that leads our church, and Phil, when I think about you, you're like a global church elder. You're not just leading in a local church, you're leading, man, globally in the big capital C church and all of what Jesus is doing around the world. So thank you for being with us, and you bring something to the table I definitely like. There's a lot of things I like, but this is one thing that I for sure like, which is experience. So today we need your wisdom and we need your experience. And to just dive straight in, could you give us a history lesson? Could you provide some history on this piece of property that we're sitting on today? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty incredible opportunity to tell a story that, that I literally have been having the privilege to tell across the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've got my pictures and I have a part of the the transition of the church here, and, and I love telling that story about what God is doing at the very present, but also also telling the story from the past. I mean, there was a time that this facility looked like this, and as we look at the picture, I mean, that... Um, That's where we're sitting right now. You, we literally least, are. Yeah. Yeah, we are sitting in that room right, right now, and we're probably sitting on where the stage was at at that mm -hmm. time, where yes. the pulpit, and maybe where the organ or the piano was at. And, um, but there's been a transformation of what God has done over the past six years from, from that moment. I took that picture. It was the last, the last service, and that service was a funeral service. We literally, we met the, the uh, six to ten people that were remaining. We met for a month, and it was a closure. It was a time of of closing this generation and making way away for another generation. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stories that go along with that, that journey. But um, I have to go back about 18 years ago when I met with this group that uh, at that time 18 years ago was probably around maybe 12, 14, not, not much more than what it was six years ago. And so when I met with them 18 years ago, I sat down with them and talked, you know, just as we were having a conversation like this about what are some of their options and what are some of the possibilities for this facility. And I shared with them that there was a Hispanic church, a thriving church that was looking for a facility. And I told them, I told them that they had the opportunity to, to give, that, give this facility to a Hispanic church or they could remain a senior adult church. They chose the, the latter. And as just as a biological clock eventually catches up, uh, they got to a point about six years ago that they could not uh, pay the bills and uh, the air conditioner and the heater had broke and uh, they, they did not want to uh, put the money into it and literally came to a point where they agreed that their work had concluded, and it was time to start something new. And what an incredible experience that has been yeah. <laughs> to watch what God has been doing over the past six years 
But 18 years ago, when we were walking out of, that, out of that meeting where I shared with them about either becoming a senior adult church or a Hispanic church, I walked out with one of the men, and we stood out in the parking lot. And uh, we had left the, the portico area, and we're at the drive through and uh, we were standing just right on the edge of the, the asphalt. And it was like a very emotional moment where I was standing beside a layman that was getting ready to make a decision. He and the other group were going to make a decision about the future. And, and I, I looked at him, and it was very much impressed on my heart of what God was showing me. And that was what I see today. I, I saw 18 years ago the cars that were going to be parked all over this facility. I mean, I could see it, and I started weeping, and I tried to share that with him, and he wasn't connecting to that. He thought I was having an emotional breakdown or something. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, and, and as I looked out the window at your office, you know, I see the cars over in the shopping center area. I didn't see that, <laughs> but I saw the cars parked over here and just people having a hard time finding a parking space. I saw that. And then I saw the multitudes of people that would be coming in and out of here. And I said to that group later on, I said, I hope mm. that when this transition happens that you will be blessed by driving by this facility and seeing this. And I hope they do that. And, and for the 18 years that I was patiently waiting for something to happen, God taught me what patience was. <laughs> yeah. And I had to learn that in the midst of the journey. And it's something that we have all got to learn to be patient for what God wants to eventually give us and let us experience the fullness of his blessings in. Wow. So you're saying we today, make sure we all get this, we are sitting in the fulfillment of a vision that Phil had 18 years ago. Can we praise Jesus yeah. for that? I mean, that is amazing. So yeah, me, go ahead. Me, I mean, I didn't tell this in the second service, and I, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. There's another part of the story that's just kind of it's a game changer. So when I was in your office this morning early, and we were praying, and I was hearing the children coming in, and they were crying, and I just started weeping. And I thought, God, this is it. This is what this is about. You know, I didn't hear that noise 18 years ago. There was no children. The only time children showed up on this property is when they had an Easter egg hunt. And for the neighborhood, children would come, but they never got connected. You know, a lot of reasons behind that. But, you know, one of the things I'll never forget, six, seven years ago, I, I went up into the nursery area where it's changed. You've moved some walls, which is good. But it, it <laughs> looked different back then. And when I walked into that room, I, I, I saw a huge Tonka toy pickup, a uh, dump truck. I mean, it was huge. It was heavy. Mm -hmm. And I thought, boy, this is a safety hazard. <laughs> you know, some child following this and <laughs> cut their head, you know. And so I picked it up, and it was heavy. It was made out of cast iron. And, and I turned it over. On the bottom side, there was a trademark symbol, and it said 1949. That was just six years, six, seven <laughs> years ago, 1949. And so that's what the nursery looked like. Wow. I mean, it had toys, you know, that were a little ancient and uh, been worn out. <laughs> <laughs> they had been leftovers from another yeah. house. So I, I looked at that, and I took, I took that to my office. And, I, and I, was, I thought, I wonder what this thing is worth. And so I got on eBay, and I found it. And it was worth $8,000. <laughs> So the air conditioner and the heater doesn't work here, okay? Uh -huh. I'm sitting, I got $8,000 in my hand. I sold that for $8,000, and we got the heater and the air conditioner fixed. <laughs> That's Isn't awesome. Good? Yeah, I mean, is that not awesome? <laughs> a Tonka truck. Yeah, a Tonka truck. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I love it. I don't tell that story too many times. <laughs> I, you had never told me until the 9 o'clock yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the thing about this moment that we're sitting in is it'd be so easy for us to miss it. It'd be so easy for us to miss the incredible opportunity that God has put in front of us. So could you help us, Phil? Like, what are some traps that we need to recognize and avoid in order to step into all that God has for us right now in this moment? 
That's a great question because um, every generation has its traps. My generation, your generation, and as we see on that picture, the generation that was before, you know, that was before me, they, they had their traps. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was obvious. They got to a point to where this, it, it closed. Mm -hmm. And it was obvious that they fell in to, to some traps. I, I, I'm reminded of a verse of scripture that has been uh, kind of significant to me here lately. And that's from Acts chapter 13, uh, verse 36. And it says, uh, for David after he had served in his own generation, by the will of God fell asleep and was buried with his fathers. Sounds like kind of a strange verse of scripture to, to lean into. But for me in my life and where I'm at at this season, this living in his own generation mm -hmm. has really resonated with me in my heart because even, you know, as... As I relate to you and as I relate to many, many different generations, I mean, I, I want to avoid those traps. Yeah. I want to finish well. Mm -hmm. I want to finish in an excellent way. But I'm reminded of the verse of Scripture in John chapter 8, verse 38. It says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Mm. I mean, that's Jesus saying, this is my mission. This is my purpose. That is to do the will of the Father and to do the will of the one that sent me here. I mean, if, when we avoid traps, we hold on to the reality of what God has sent us here to do, just as he sent Jesus here, and he had a full comprehension of what that was all about. When we recognize the purpose and the mission that God has sent us here for, we, we we're leaning into avoiding the traps. Yeah. But I think when I come to realize some other aspects of that question is that it's important for us to, to not be a bond servant to our generation. Mm, that's good. Uh, we, we are to be careful and not to drop into the habits that create those traps. Yeah, that's good. And habits can do that. And habits can become very uh, traditional and they can become very ordinary parts of our life. They can be the norm, mm -hmm. but they can be critical traps. There is the, the, the customs of the day, whatever it might be, the, the fad or something, you know, can be a, can be a trap. And, and the ideas of the generation in which we live can be a trap. Listen, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only for one generation. The gospel is for all generations. That's good. And the only way that we can reach and carry the gospel into other generations is to have an awareness in our mind that I'm not to get into the trap and the habits and to be a bondservant to the generation that I'm living in. Yeah. And when I'm not that bondservant to the things that are constantly a creating noise around my life, that helps me that helps me to be the gospel of Jesus in the generation that I'm living in and helping the generation that is behind me. That's good. And that, that's not even yet to be born in <laughs> Psalm 78, it says. But then also in the next place, and that is don't fly from your generation. Can I stop there? Yeah. Don't miss the tension that Phil just created. He said, let's not be a bondservant to the generation but don't fly from it. Don't run from it. Don't disconnect from it. So could you, that's awesome. Could you dig more into that tension? Yeah, and, and this verse of Scripture comes to my mind, and that's in 1 John chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, do not love the world mm -hmm. or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to tell you, I wrestle with that verse of Scripture because as a missionary, I realize that I've got to be in the world. Yeah. 
I mean, the, the lostness is in the world. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I've got to be comfortable with being in the world, and I've got to be strong and grounded in the substance of my faith mm -hmm. to where the world is not influencing me, but I'm letting the gospel influence the world that I'm, I'm, I'm living in, yeah. I'm, I'm being in. And, um, and, and one, of the, one of the struggles that I have is being in ministry as long as I have been taught. And, and, and this, is be, this will be something that you wrestle with, and you maybe have already experienced it. You know, as early on in our life, as early Christians, it's kind of like a pyramid. Early, early in our Christian life, we, there's a broadness of the, of the lostness that we have influence in. I mean, it's broad. But as we grow older and more mature in our Christian life, sometimes we're, we're, we're getting up to a, the crest of the pyramid and that we find ourselves with all Christians. Yeah. And we've removed ourselves from the world. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that is, that's a trap that sometimes that we've got to avoid because we need to be in the world but not influenced by the world to where we are making an impact for the for the gospel. So don't don't fly from from your generation. That's good. Or don't don't s seek a flight of freedom <laughs> from your generation. I like the story the little epistle of Philemon where Philemon and Onesimus where Onesimus stole fi from Philemon and the apostle Paul told uh, told Philemon he says you must receive Onesimus back even though he stole from you. Mm -hmm. But Paul says to Philemon Put that on my account. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Paul said to Philemon, receive Onesimus back, even though he is stolen from you, but put that on my account. Only a man can say that if he has received the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's good. <laughs> and that's what Paul was given testimony about. And another thing that I would say is, is perf perform common duties of life. We can avoid traps by living out the common duties of life that we have. Todd, I've, I have not told you this before, and, and, and I hope it doesn't, I hope I don't, I, I like being where I met with you, but, <laughs> but after I tell you this, you might think, well, man, what company do I have? I mean, I, mean, I struggled in school. Anybody with him in the house today? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I struggled in school, struggled in high school, and I struggled in, in college, and I struggled in seminary, which was very intense, you know, having to take Greek and Hebrew and all these different languages. And here I'm trying to struggle with English, you know, in the 11th grade. Yeah. And I'm having to read Shakespeare, and I'm having to come back and write a paper on that. And, and I had a teacher that she knew because I was very passionate about living Jesus and during my high school years, and, and my teacher knew about my passion. And, um, I mean, I, I did not keep that to myself, and I didn't try to annoy people. But um, she, she came up to me. She, was, she asked me to stay behind class, and so everybody left. And she, came, she said to me, she said, Phil... I understand, you know, what you are trying to do, and I understand the language that you're using, that God's called you into ministry. She says, I get that. She says, but I just, you, I just need you to know that if, if you can't read the King James Version, you know, how, how are you going to be used? Don't you think you should think about doing something else with your life? She says, if you can't, articulate what Shakespeare is saying. How can you articulate what the KJ, King James Version Bible is saying? Well, thank goodness she didn't know, and I didn't know at that time that there was an ESV that was coming out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Better translation. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> Praise God. You know. uh, but, you know, the, the, the re, you know the, my, my, my point in saying this is that all of us are in different lanes of life. And, and I enjoyed hard work. And, there, and, and I had some people help me to understand this because I would, I'd, I'd wrestle with people saying, hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling in how to connect this, how to communicate this, and how to connect that with other people. But I, I, love, I love working and I love doing 
doing this. And I, I love grinding it out. I love getting out and cutting grass. I'm delivering newspapers at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And, man, I just love that. Mm. And it's like this, this man who was a tugboat operator that mentored me and discipled mm. me. Mm. He said, Phil, look at this. He said, you find refuge in places of when God is speaking to you. And he said, look at, he says, you're out there on your bike riding around a neighborhood throwing papers at 4 o'clock in the morning. There's nobody else out there but you, your bike, your newspapers, and God. Mm. And it clicked. Mm. I mean, how many times I had a conversation with God? How many times did I see the sun rise on the East Coast in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where I was, where I was raised and where I was delivering newspapers and wrestled with God? And I saw the majesty of God show up <laughs> every morning. Yeah. <laughs> An English teacher couldn't teach me that. Wow. Mm. But she was okay. <laughs> she gave me a hard time. Well, so, I, so, so moving quickly, to just common duties of life help us to to not get into the traps of and, life. And I'll just say there, I really appreciate you saying that because I think sometimes it's easy for us, no matter what generation we find ourselves in, to look for the spectacular, to look for these awesome big moments. But what you're saying is God's going to meet us in the common, in the mundane. Yes. And you may even be sitting there and going, well, my profession is less than someone else's profession, or I'm struggling to get in the profession I want to get to. But like God has put you there. He will meet you there. And if we will just open our eyes, we'll realize that Jesus is in the mundane. He's in the common. He wants to yeah. us to encounter him there, and he wants to use us there. Yeah. So I think that's just such a powerful yeah. word and aligns with who we are as a public church. Yeah, and just and one other thing, and we'll, we'll move on, and uh, and, and the, that, that is that it's, it's well that we remember that we are preparing for somebody to come after us. Man, that's good. Yeah. Now, I mean, this just hit me, and, and, um, and I don't know if it's because my wife's not here, and, and she was here with us in the, the first two services, but I really wish I had thought about this sooner. And, um, and, and maybe just for somebody here that the Lord's put this on my heart, Avoiding the traps is is realizing that when we fall into a trap, we are disappointing other people mm. that have invested in our life. Mm. Number one, God has invested in our life. Mm. Your parents, my parents, my parents are still alive. Mm. If I have them for another five years, it'll be a miracle. Mm. But I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to. I don't want to disappoint the men that have been mentors to me. Yeah. And when when the Holy Spirit puts that on my heart, that that is a good reminder mm -hmm. to to not fall into that trap. Wow. Because I need to avoid the disappointments, but also not disappoint the people that are still to come after me. Wow, man, that's really good. And could we talk just about a specific trap that I think we as a church could fall into? We're six years old, and it'd be really easy for us to become an inward-facing church. And what I mean by that is we become so consumed with the people in the room and with our preferences that we forget about the people yeah. in our office and yeah. on our campus and even in our families that need the hope of Jesus and need the message of Jesus. So how can we focus on those who aren't here instead of being consumed by those who are? Well, that's, that is a great question. Because that was the question that obviously the church that we showed in the picture earlier did not ask that question. Yeah. Because when you stop asking that question, it eventually leads to that. I'm going to be with a group of people tonight. I'll be meeting with them. But they've not been asking that question for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So to, to think in terms of about what you're asking there, that I think that, the, and I believe in my heart and, and founded in the truth of the Word of God, that we have always have got to have a perspective of who is not here. That's good. <laughs> We've always got to be looking around us and be asking the question, who's not here? Yeah. I, I like to call myself a missiologist. <laughs> Sounds important, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, but I like that term, and it really does describe what my heartbeat is. 
I like to see myself, I feel like God has called me to be a missionary here in Cleveland and Bradley County and, and, and Tennessee and the surrounding areas. But I, when I think about missiology, missiology is accomplished at the intersection of the gospel, mm -hmm. culture, and the church. <laughs> and so avoiding the trap of, of being inward focus is that we, we keep that into perspective, mm -hmm. that the gospel is in us. Jesus is in us. We are living out the gospel. But that gospel has got to be lived out in the culture mm -hmm. and the church. You focus on who is not here. The Bible says God desires that all people be saved and yeah. come to the knowledge of the truth. All people. <laughs> Didn't say the people that look like me, thank goodness. Didn't say the people that look like you or the people that are in your network. The Bible says all people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and boy, how our communities are changing rapidly. Yeah. And the gospel is for them. Now, an exciting part of that and how that is lived out, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 says, every tribe and language and people and nation will be present mm. in heaven. <laughs> Our intersection with culture should point others toward restoration and redemption through Jesus Christ. And, and it's well for us to, to have a good idea of who people are mm -hmm. around us. And I think I, I, put, I put that in the area of about three or four different uh, categories. One is the settlers. I mean, they, they are people that lived well. They raised a family, and uh, they are now enjoying their, their grandchildren, and uh, they are enjoying some great-grandchildren for, for some of them. And, and they very much act as a consumer when they are wanting to bless you. <laughs> some of you have got your grandparents still alive. Count that as a blessing. And there are some of the ones that love you as a consumer. <laughs> Instead of going to Walmart or maybe going to some store and spending the extra cash that they've got, I mean, they're, they're banking some of that for you. Mm. And, um, and, and they, they, are, they are people that are realizing that when their roof has to be replaced, they're realizing that this may be the last time that they replace their roof. Now, that's a, that's, that's a defining moment in life. Yeah. And there are people that think, it, think that way. Yeah. Or they, they are buying a car, and they're thinking, well, this is the last car that, that I'm going to buy. But I want, to, I, want you to, I want you to please hear my heart. That is a generation of people that may not be here, but they are around you. Yeah. And they are hurting. I mean, I got my hair cut on Tuesday. <laughs> and where I get my hair cut, there's usually a whole lot of ladies in there. <laughs> it's the most comfortable place that I go into once a month or once every three weeks or something. But I, as, as a missionary and as a missiologist, my ears were always open and my eyes were always open. And so there was, a, there was a man that was sitting beside me, and he's a retired doctor from here in Cleveland. And he retired because his wife had a stroke. And so isn't it amazing that here he was a physician that took care of patients, and there he's got one patient, and that's wow. his wife. Mm. And when she had to go from the chair to the sink, who got her there? He did. Mm. He got up and took her. I mean, that's, that's a struggle that he's dealing with in his life. So then there was another lady that was sitting beside me, and she was sitting beside her friend, and they started talking. The lady that was sitting, and I was listening. <laughs> and so the lady that was sitting beside me, her husband just died. And this is what she was crying about, and she was telling her friend, I've got, I, I've got to figure out how much it's going to cost me to cut my grass this summer. Because my husband always did that. And then she started telling about all the leaves that were on the roof, in the gutters, all around the house. And she was saying, he used to clean the gutters in the yard. 
And now I've got to figure out how to get that done. So I wanna, here's what I'm saying. The church in order to realize the people that are outside and realize that they're the settlers and they have needs, is God raising us up to touch that need? Just like you're going to be touching the city fields and uh, you're going to Romania Mm -hmm. and you're touching in those areas. But is there people that God has called to put a rake in their hand and just to show up in a spontaneous way where there's an incredible need. And just in the name of Jesus saying, hey, we're from public church, and we're just going to bless you today. That's good. I mean, that's a game changer. It is. So there's the settlers, and then there are, I, I call this the shiners. <laughs> the, the shiners are those that, um, I mean, they're, they're going for it. I mean, they're doing all that they can right now to get all they can. They're in this sy- syndrome of getting everything that they can and, and, and canning everything while they can, can, can get things. Mm-hmm. What, what are they finding? I mean, they're, they're finding that sometimes they're on a treadmill. Mm-hmm. Um, they're finding that there's hopelessness, that they can never get all that they want to have. And, and so what was a smile is now turned to a frown because they're wore out. They're, they're exhausted. Um, when, when I see that scenario around me or I see that happening within a generation that's, that's around my life, I, 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 there's a verse of Scripture that comes to my mind. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. It says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. So there is that shiner generation, that shiner group. I mean, they're trying to do everything. To, and they're in the church even as well and thinking that if I just check this off on my task list, I mean, I've accomplished everything. But the Bible says we've been saved by grace. I can't do enough good things. That's right. I can't show up enough. But it's by grace that I've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And then the last thing that I would say is that we've, we've got to look at the rising mm. generation. The rising generation is the children. It's the children that I heard this morning. It's the children that I saw walking out of the annex building when I was looking out of the window of your office. And I was about weeping and crying. You see, it's the chill, it's the rising. They're going to live longer than me. They're going to live longer than you. And it's the rising generation that Psalm 78 says that we need to tell them about the mighty works of God. We need to tell them the mighty works of God to those that are living. In Psalm 78, it says that we are to tell them the mighty works of God to those that are not been born and still yet the generation still to come. So I feel like that, Todd, that that helps us to understand that we live in an era of where people are lonely, where they're worry, there's temptation mm. and discouragement. And the pitfall to avoid is not seeing the people that are not here. Man, that's huge. It's seeing the others. Yeah, I love that. And that's a game changer of even just being able to look around and see those people in our everyday lives. And so, Phil, my final question for you is this. Why do you still follow Jesus? <laughs> I mean, I knew you were going to ask me that question. And I sent a... I sent a text message to a friend of mine last night, and I told him, I said, hey, this is what I need you to pray. And Todd's going to ask me this question, and I've been weeping. Um, I mean, I was saved when I was nine years old. And, yeah, did I, did I fall into some traps? Yeah. And, um, but to be where I'm at right now and to be sitting here with you, I mean, it's, it's a game changer to realize how faithful God has been. And, and, and I followed Jesus because of how faithful he's been to me. And it's my desire to wake up every morning and to be authentic in Jesus Christ and to be authentic in who I am. 
I follow Jesus through him so I can be all that he wants me to be. Todd, it's not natural for me to be an optimistic person. I think that's because of hurt that I've experienced in my life and, um, and, and things that I have walked through with other people at this stage of life. But you, I, whenever I hear that you're, you are in the room, I run. And if you call me up, send me a text message and say, hey, Phil, can we get together? I mean, whatever is convenient for you, I want to run because you're the most optimistic person. And, and, and I follow Jesus because I need to be optimistic and I need to be around people that are optimistic. And I know that you feel like, and I saw where you wrote this, you, you said that your optimism sometimes can annoy other people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to say to you in front of your church, your people, uh, you, you thrive in optimism and, and annoy all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean that's, that's where it is. Because when we, we realize the authenticity of being in Jesus, that, that helps us to be optimistic. Yeah, it might not be natural for some of us, but some of us need to be optimistic. And it's well that we follow Jesus because of that. Too often, I'm around a lot of desperate and discouraging situations. I follow Jesus because he's light yeah. in a dark world. The Bible says in John chapter 12, verse 46, I've come as a light in the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. <laughs> I think that's optimism. <laughs> Jesus came that you and I, you and I, you and I can have life and have life more abundantly. I, I follow Jesus because I had the privilege of being in the center, the center, the epicenter of the work of God. And I know that. It's a privilege to be with God's people. And that is the epicenter of what God is up to. And I don't want to miss what God is up to. I mean, I, I know that, that social media and things that are around us can feel, can feel like that they are moving mountains and that they are changing the world. But I want to say to you that the church has been around a long, long time. And it's going to be around for a lot longer. And I follow Jesus because I'm privileged to be in the epicenter of what literally is changing the world. Yeah, that's awesome. Can we praise Jesus for that? That's awesome. And the last thing is that as a pastor, this is you and I talking here, there's nobody else. As a pastor, I had the privilege of telling you some years ago that ministry can be very stressful, it can demand our time, but the greatest gift that God has given you is Whitney and your two children at this time. And that we that we reel it in and realize that we are a part of the epicenter of what God is up to. And the greatest gift that you can give to your children, to your two boys, and I'm defining it for what it is at the present, is them having an the opportunity to see a dad that's praying and then a dad that is willing to have fun with them on a Saturday morning instead of putting the last touches on a sermon on Sunday morning. For a mistake that I made, I seek to give that to you that you would learn that let Saturday morning be church for your family and have fun. If it's making pancakes a hot <laughs> breakfast, let the pancake mix go all over the place because it can be cleaned <laughs> up. That's awesome. Amen? Amen. Thank so you. that's why I get up and follow Jesus every day. I love that. And I asked Phil that question because we recognize that some of you either watching or in the room may not follow Jesus. And we wanted you to hear from him why he does. And we want to give you the opportunity to follow Jesus. 
So as public worship comes up, they're going to lead us in a couple songs to end our time. And at any moment, if you don't follow him, someone from our prayer team would be in the back. Go have a conversation with them because Jesus died for you. He rose again. And he is today offering you life and life more abundantly. And for all of us, here's what Phil and I and several people have been praying. We've been praying that the Holy Spirit would cause an intersection an intersection between some wisdom he shared and a specific situation in your life. I know for me, that means we're out of pancake mix. I've cooked them all. We got to go to Aldi and buy some pancake mix. So on Saturday mornings, I can make sure I'm growing in that and doing that because I'm not there yet. That, that's specific to me. But we've praying and in faith, we believe that the Holy Spirit has spoken to every single one of us in a specific situation. So reflect on that. Take some time and let him speak to you. And then ask this question, what action? should I take because of how you've spoken to me? So take some time and do that. And Phil, just to give us a moment to reflect, would you just pray yeah, over our church? Absolutely. Father God, what a holy moment that, Lord, that we've been able to stand on holy ground this morning. Father, you ordained and you set this place aside many years ago. Father, 18 years ago, you saw this and you breathed it into my heart, into my life, and I give you thanks. It wasn't to be a senior adult church. It wasn't to be a Hispanic church. It was to be a public church, a church for everyone. And I pray, Father, that with the sincerity of our hearts, that we recognize that, God, that you have given us abundant life through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that in this room, that, Father, that there would be individuals ready to run to Jesus. And I pray that, Father, that for our time today, that, God, that you'd be exalted and honored and glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.